Ever wonder how many robins there are in the world, or bluebirds, or maybe even crows? My name's Terry Rich. I'm an ornithologist, a birder, and uh, frankly, I'm a bird lover. Uh, this talk was recorded in Boise, Idaho at the Foothills Learning Center, where I give a talk at least once a month, and this one on February 9th, 2018. We're going to talk about bird population numbers and how we figure out how many robins and crows and bluebirds there are. One of the techniques that is really valuable to us is the breeding bird survey. Uh, many people may have heard of this survey. It was originally designed to track population trends over long periods of time, many years and, and even decades. But we can use those data also to estimate numbers of robins and bluebirds and crows and so on. This talk has been designed for everybody. You don't have to be an ornithologist or an expert birder. We're talking about common birds and have some fairly uh, plain messages to convey to you. You may not know that uh, bird populations are declining around the world. They're also declining in the U.S. and in North America and at any scale you really want to look at. What we do with these population estimates is to help us prioritize birds for conservation action. So some species have very large numbers we're not so worried about, and others with smaller numbers, then we, we start to target them for conservation. I hope after you hear this, you will think about birds in your area and ways that you might be able to take conservation action, um, ways that you haven't uh, taken before. We love to get feedback, and when we're talking to a live audience, that's very easy, but we hope you will also take advantage on this online forum to provide feedback, tell us what you like, maybe what you didn't like so much, and also ideas for content you'd like to see in the future. What I just want to talk about a little bit is uh, how we estimate bird population sizes, and then what are some actual sizes, and then just kind of some fun facts, kind of rambling around and comparing different things to different things, so I hope you find it interesting. I, I think it's kind of fun. The uh, sources of bird population, uh, Population estimates come from a lot of different sorts of surveys, and some of these are designed to, to monitor populations. Last month I talked about population trends and, and looking at trends over time, and today then I'm going to be talking about how big are, how many robins are there, how many sparrows are there, that sort of thing. So it's not trends so much as just how many birds are out there. And I'm going to focus on the breeding bird survey. The, the biggest, longest running and best program for bre uh, breeding birds is the breeding bird survey. And I'll talk about that in a little bit of detail. It's always nice to have a little bit of perspective about population sizes, and unfortunately this is a really, really super sad example of the most abundant um, bird that was ever in North America by far. And you can read these, quote from uh, Leopold, and you probably seeing these various facts about how big these flocks were. So the point is, even though this, this bird numbered in the billions, we drove it to extinction. Our general theory here is very simple. If bird populations are really big, they're going to be safer than if they're really tiny. That's the pretty straightforward stuff. But being really big is no guarantee if you're not uh, doing other things correctly. Uh, those of you who were here last month saw this, and we, we, the North American Bird Conservation Initiative people and partners and white people, those of us who work in conservation, when we try to figure out how vulnerable a species is, you know, what species we'd be most worried about and which species we're least worried about, we, we score each species on these six factors. And last month I talked about population trends, and we saw, for example, even Grosbeak is just on a dive. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, all across its range. Uh, pine siskins on a very steep decline. Uh, so anyway, we talked about that last one. But another one of these factors is population size. One reason we like to work with numbers is it gives you some idea if you're going to conserve this species. Do we need 10 more? Do we need 1,000 more? Do we need a million more? What are we talking about? It also then translates more directly to habitat. You know, if we want to hundred more great horned owls, and each great horned owl needs a square mile, then we know what our goal is for habitat. So it makes it fairly straightforward to do that. And it's also better communication when you talk in the newspaper, you're on TV. If you talk about trends and indices, I think a lot of it kind of goes right past the public. But if you talk about the numbers of birds, then it's something that people get their hand on, get their mind around a little more easily. So we spent quite a bit of time trying to figure this out. 
So again, uh, so this last month, the green bridge survey routes, where we get all the all the data for our uh, land birds. You can see it's quite good for the U.S. because we've got routes everywhere. It's quite good for southern Canada, but because these are on roads, as soon as you get away from roads, get up in here into the northern boreal. Mexico's a different issue, but the northern boreal, Alaska, not nearly as many roads, and so you just have fewer routes. So a lot of the data is just coming from the core of where the people are. So very briefly, the Greenberg survey the routes, you understand the method, there's 50 stops, you drive in the car, uh, they're half a mile apart, and at each stop you get out for three minutes and count every bird you see in here within a quarter mile radius. Um, then the whole route is 24 and a half miles and it takes four and a half to five hours to do. And so there's 4,300 some of us, I do eight routes, we do these routes every year. It's just one, one time in the, in, during the breeding season. Uh, but that's where the, these data come from. It's getting to be a, just a, a huge and really valuable data set. A good friend of mine from Cornell, probably 15 years ago, said, you know, we actually know how much area we're sampling, and we know how many birds we're counting. We can just convert those straight to densities and get population estimates. He did that, and that's uh, kind of the simple arithmetic step that it took to start saying how many sparrows have we got out there. I love this. I was looking around for uh, green bird survey slides. You gotta love this. So, you can't see that. That's a Minnesota license plate called Bujay. Buj <laughs> and this woman, this is probably June. And why is she bundled up? Is she cold? <laughs> mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Uh -oh. Mosquitoes. So she's even got gloves on because of the mosquitoes in that woods right there in northern Minnesota. It's one thing we don't have to worry about around here. Calculating how many birds are out there is, is kind of is very straightforward from an arithmetic standpoint, but the things we started thinking about got really interesting, and I want to share some of those. So this first one we call the pair adjustment. That is, every time you detect a bird, say the pinion jay, that's kind of an odd one to have up there, I guess, but the, every time you hear a bird singing and you count it, how many other birds are out there? Because you know you're not counting them all. If you're counting bobolinks, we know that bobolinks are polygamous, so each male has three or four females. Count one bobolink, you've got to multiply that by four <coughs> or five to get the true number of bobolinks. If you're looking at these bank swallows like we have over here, they're flying around in big swarm. If you count those, you're probably counting every single bird that's there, if you can count them. That's, that's another issue is estimating a big flock of swallows. But the point is, well, the birds are probably out and moving, and you're going to count most of them. So they're not, they're not all these hidden birds like you have with other ones. And then even when you get to the most basic sort of territory bird like this yellow-breasted chat, you have all these interesting questions. For example, do females sing in that species? You hear chat in the bush. Is that guaranteed a male? And therefore there's also a female, so multiply by two. Well, if the females sing two, then you don't need to multiply because you're counting males and females. Unfortunately, this varies by species and by all kinds of other factors. So it's really messy. Here's another problem. Sometimes as soon as males mate, their song production drops off because they've been singing to get a mate. They get a mate, they, they don't sing so much. And especially once they have young in the nest, they almost com go completely silent. When you're doing these surveys, you want to get out there while they're still singing and not wait too late in the season. Otherwise, you're, gonna, you're just not going to detect anything because they're just not singing. And this is especially, like I said, just mentioned that now, um, a lot of males are, just become very quiet when they have young in the nest or they're feeding young they're out of the nest because they're trying not to get eaten. So everybody's just really quiet. So you've got to figure this out for each species. And we've done that. There's another adjustment we call it the area adjustment factor. And we figure if you're out there and uh, you're, you're counting all the birds within a quarter mile, you're probably going to pick up all the ravens there are, right? And the ravens and maybe red tails. So, so birds that are really super visible and really, really loud, long-billed curlews, you can hear them two miles away, I swear. Uh, you figure you're counting them all. So Terry? Yes. So when you say that quarter mile, you're in one spot and you're rotating, right. or you're walking around in that quarter mile? Um, no, you're not. You're not to walk around. 
you're to stand still. Uh, what I do is just sort of rotate like, okay. like a beacon. Okay. And then you can have a person help you record so you can watch more. Um, but you can't pish, you can't use playback, you can't do anything. You're supposed to be an invisible recorder of what's happening in the world. So we figure we're getting all the ravens. We don't have to multiply them for ravens. But there's some birds, and we've done the test of this. This has been tested through actual research uh, for a number of species. Open country and louder, louder forest birds, we figure you're not really sampling the whole quarter mile because you, you're not picking those birds up. So you're really sampling a smaller area. That means there's more birds than you have to do another calculation adjustment. There's more birds than you think, so you're just not hearing, you're not sampling that whole area. And it just gets worse. When you get into quieter forest birds like warblers, you know, if you're up, up in the forest and dense coniferous forest and the warblers are singing, that song doesn't carry through the woods that far, especially for like yellow worms. So you're really not sampling that big of an area. Things like kinglets and thrushes, on the other hand, they really pound their songs out and you're probably getting them all. And then finally, it's really bad are hummingbirds. Uh, anything that isn't very noisy, sings very quietly, or isn't very conspicuous, we know we're not sampling a quarter mile out for calliope hummingbirds when you're up in the forest. You're sampling actually a fairly, fairly small space, maybe the size of this room, something like that. So the point is, we're getting a good count on these guys, and we're probably, well, we're certainly undercounting all of these others that are not noisy and conspicuous. So we need to multiply all the numbers to, by a factor of bringing that up. And I've showed you some of these slides before. I love this stuff. How does detection vary over the day? The breeding bird survey starts uh, 30 minutes before sunrise. So that's the first three minute count right there. This is data from the entire breeding bird survey. Hundreds of thousands of observations in this old bar graph. Anybody who knows Nighthawks isn't too surprised about this. That first stop, that first three minutes, a half hour before sunrise, you're getting the maximum count of Nighthawks. But look how quickly it drops off. Even, so you count for three minutes, maybe it takes you three minutes to drive. Six minutes later, they've already dropped down this much. Six minutes later than that, they're down here. Six minutes later. So a half hour, by the time the sun's up, most of the Nighthawks are not being detected. They're already roosting somewhere. So we figure there's almost seven times as many Nighthawks out there as we think. Because later in the day, you're not counting them because they're all, they're all roosting. And they go to roost pretty fast, as you can see. You have some birds have the opposite pattern. Turkey vultures, red-tailed hawks are good. You know, they're not dinking around when it's cold and they're wet and they're sitting in the trees waiting for the sun to come up and dry off their feathers and get some thermals and start to soar. So their activity goes up and up and up and up and even... So here's the 50th stop right here, four and a half hours after you started. And turkey vultures are still going up, basically. So there's, again, way more turkey vultures out there than we count in these surveys. And then you have a few agreeable species, like the house finch and the American goldfinch, that are essentially just as active a half hour before sunrise as they are four hours later. So we really don't have to multiply their, um, the count by anything, because we're detecting who's there at a very regular pace. Uh, these are some data I collected from the Shoshone District many years ago now. Uh, showing how detectability drops off for these species right here. So, and this is from this, so this is distance away from me as an observer. So look at how fast, even here's 20 meters, 40 meters, 60 meters only, not even, you know, length of the football field. You're already, you know, not detecting probably a whole bunch of birds there because you just can't hear them as well. They're singing, they're facing in the other direction. And then it finally drops off here at 100 meters. You're just not picking up anything but metal arcs, really, that would blast out there so long. So anyway, the whole point of this is just to say we've got ways of measuring um, the adjustments we need to make to get truer population estimates. Nobody can ever guess that number, so I'll just put it up there. <laughs> so we made all these population estimates and put them in a column and added them up. And uh, we figure at the start of the breeding season, the continental U.S. and Canada are 4.6 billion. This is just land birds. This isn't waterfowl or anything else. Again, we're talking about warblers, sparrows, and 
other species. It seems like a pretty good number, but you know, compared to Basic, what? Basically, all passerine. Um, no, well, let's see. Not all passerines, because this to include woodpeckers, um, hummingbirds, non-passerine land birds, birds that are yeah. We can, it's hard to define these groups. We define them as land birds, <laughs> which it does a pretty good job, but it's more than passerines. And then if you just graph the population sizes of, of so here's 448 species of land birds, you got one, I'll show you which one it is right here, 310 million, and then 260 million. These are individual species. The point is you can see that like a lot of things in nature, there are a few that are very, very numerous, a whole bunch that are kind of in the middle, and then a whole bunch of species out here, they don't even show, they're so, the populations are so small, they don't even show up compared to these very numerous species, which we'll look at. So this is really pretty much a, a normal distribution of trees in the forest or anything else you might expect in nature. Nothing unusual. All right, so let's look at the most, uh, the most abundant native land birds. Could have you guess at this, but that's largely a waste of time, I think. Number 10, grackle. I thought this was interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of swines and thrushes because of the boreal forest. That might not surprise too many people. Morning dove hanging in there so far, anyway. Blackbird. We don't, we get like one at Hyatt Lakes in the winter, but if you, I was back in Wisconsin this fall, it just flocks of white, white throats, uh, which can be fairly challenging to identify actually. The, the young vary quite a bit. Red-eyed vireo, another bird that we don't get very often around here, but common in the east and the northeastern forests. Hmm. Dark-eyed junco, 200 million dark-eyed juncos. And what do you think is number one? We can guess on that one. What? These are native species. Yeah. Native species. Sorry, native. We'll talk about starlings in a second. What do you think? House finch. House finch? That's a good guess. Ta da! So that's the big, the tall bar in that graph showed 310 American robins. Again, this is the beginning of the breeding season because it's, of course, after they nest. You know, the, the, if they each have three or four or five young, you can do the arithmetic, of course. All kinds of nest failures and the young get eaten by everything, and it's not quite that simple. But I mean, there's quite a bump when the young birds come out, and then they, a lot of them perish by winter or by the end of winter, and then you're kind of back to where you started. So here's the introduced species. Uh, and this one, I'm not sure this is uh, enough. <laughs> I think I have 8 million in my neighborhood this year. <laughs> uh, as, as we've seen, uh, these guys are just exploding. They've exploded across uh, North America. And pheasants mm. bounce around a lot. I, I don't know how good that number is. Same with great parts. Tucker, that's probably pretty good. But I think the point is here, and I want to look at um, starlings. More robins than starlings, huh? More robins than starlings, yeah. Twice as many, wow. Well, the nice thing is, you know, you, if you go out in the Hawaii uplands into the juniper and the mountain mahogany, you'll find robins nesting, and yet, I, you, know, you never see starlings in places yeah. like that. They're so tied to people and towns and Arbor Park and <laughs> places with cavities that fortunately are not out in the massive open spaces. Same for house sparrows. So that's the good news. So 150 million starlings, uh, note they outnumber all but three native land bird species white throated sparrows, robins, and whatever the other third one was. And the point I'm looking at these is these are all cavity nesters that, can, that starlings compete with for nest cavities and trees and in posts and the size of old barns and everything else. So they compete with kestrels. They outnumber kestrels 68 to 1. And we had, when we lived in Shoshone, we had a, I put a kestrel box across on a pole across from our house, it was on the edge of town, and the kestrels came into the box, and the starlings tried to kick the kestrels out, and I watched them fight, literally fighting. Even though a kestrel is a predator and much bigger, the starlings are ferocious, very tenacious, and very persistent. 
But you also made the point that they may not be in the same area. So you're going to have out in the plains area or open fields and stuff, you're going to find the kestrels, but you're not going to find the starlings right. out there. So right. in this close to the urban area or suburban area, you're going to have the competition, but out there you won't. Right. Yeah. You get out where you got like craters in the moon where you got cavities and limber pines and there's kestrels out there and not a starling to be found. Again, thankfully. Of course, they compete with bluebirds. They love bluebird boxes. They outnumber all three species of bluebirds, five, more than five to one. Outnumber our flickers, 18 to one. The other story, some of you heard before, a couple years ago, I was riding on the, my bike in the green belt and I heard this flicker calling just super loudly and it was like below me and very close and I, I see a flicker and a starling wrestling in the dirt mm -hmm. literally a hold of each other and the flicker was calling <laughs> like that while they were rolling around in the dirt uh, that went on for a few seconds they split up the starling took off and the flicker went into a nest cavity right there so those are my two experiences with <laughs> starlings as ferocious <laughs> competitors and then um, number all of our uh, various species of chickadees, about two, a little more than two. So starlings are a big problem, and uh, if there's some way we could get rid of them, that would be swell. All right, so now this is kind of some more fun facts, kind of walk through some of these numbers. Looking at groups of birds, so here's all the hawks, kites, and eagles, the populations. And what do you think is the most common hawk? Right. Another bird we don't get much out here, probably mm -hmm. hawk is number two. Another, kind of like a red-eyed vireo. Very common in the eastern forests and northeast up into Canada, but not up here. And then here's all the rest of the Paris hawks and everything else coming along. Much, much fewer, many fewer. So, maybe two million red tails. That's pretty cool. That's a good number. And again, we're not too surprised by that, I think, because you see them right, right They're always here. Here, literally, in all the skulls nesting down here. They're... Uh, Almost anywhere you go, in Mexico or in North America, you see red tail before too long. How about this one? All these eastern birds tend to be really common because of the amount of forest uh, in the eastern U.S. and then up into Canada. So cardinals number one by far, and then another eastern species in the hunting is number two, but still pretty numerous, almost 30 million. Like I said, I don't know if I, and I didn't update this number yet on this graph. <coughs> Morning dove is still by far the most common dove, but as we know, uh, the collar doves are closing, closing in on them. Before the collar doves exploded, number two was actually the white wing dove. But look how much, how much less common. And of course, you don't see those until you get down into southern Texas, southern Arizona. Crows and jays. What do you think is number one in this group? Blue jay. Hmm? Crow. Crows. Oh. Yeah. Crows, yay. Blue jay, number two. Again, yeah, eastern birds, eastern forest birds, not too surprising. So all of our scrub jays and scholars jays and so on are much less common gray jays, the rest of them. Are magpies in that group? Yep. And they were? They're, well, they're not in the top two. I can't remember which one they are. Uh, I have to go back and look at the data. I just see them everywhere. It's like. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm sometimes surprised I don't see them more often. I'm not saying that. Do you have no problem with the mosquitoes and the flu? Yeah, they. Why did the magpies? Yeah, the magpies definitely took a hit from the that so virus. Magpies, they're, chickadees. They're, they're starting to come back in Cuna. I mean, they're almost in the trees with the crows. Okay. Well, yeah, they may still be rebounding from the hit they took from the virus, so... Uh, Are they common in the east? No, no uh, the last month I actually showed a distribution map of the species because I like them. Um, you know, I mean, they're mostly western, but they get into western Minnesota. Western Minnesota west, they get north quite a ways, like they're up in Alaska. So they've got a big range. I don't know, the ones in my neighborhood are really wary. I, mean, I can hardly get a picture of them, they're just, as soon as you start looking at them, they go. So. I'm not sure what's going on with magpies. Uh, sorry, I can't remember which, uh, which one of these numbers that is. Uh, I'll show you a website where you can go and you can look up all the numbers you want to your heart's content if you don't get 
overwhelmed by this today. Oh, here's my group. Sparrows and allies. Lots of species. Most common sparrow? I already told you it should be the number. Hmm? White throated. White throated, exactly. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> number two. <laughs> dark eyed jungle. Yeah, okay. So 260 million dark eyed jungles and then white throats. Boreal forest species. I've got some more sparrow numbers here in a second. Oh, chicken. Number three, chicken. So the last uh, one of the regular sparrows that breeds out here in chickens. Uh, finch family? It's probably most part of this figure. Mm. So you gotta remember all these uh, all this expanse of boreal forest and taiga and tundra. We don't have a lot of uh, sampling up there, but we have enough numbers to uh, get some estimates. So, so this is covering America, United States, and Canada, yeah. or Mexico? You, yes, and Canada. Okay. American goldfinch. Swallows, what do you think? Uh, that's what I guess, and I actually don't remember. The winner is. All the bridges, yeah. all the bridges where they like to nest in big groups. Those are cliff sparrows that are under the bridges? Cliff swallows, okay. yeah. Yeah, they build the mud nests. Yeah. Of course, barn swallows build mud nests too, but they don't uh, group up big colonies like cliff swallows do. And then over here in this mud bank over here, we have bank swallows, the other big colonial nester, but they go into holes, they don't go to the mud nests. So a little different to see what's number two. There's their barn swallow. Then tree swallows, wild greens, rough wings, and so on. Much, much more fear. Uh, blackbirds. Okay, I already showed this number, right? Yeah. Yeah, red winged blackbird. Biggest population, 190 million. Mm -hmm. It's a grackle. Brown headed yeah. cowbird is doing well. And then all the orioles and Bruce uh, blackbirds. All the rest of that. Uh, get away. Uh, many of you are much, much smaller populations than the rest of our blackbirds. What do you think? Yeah, there you go. Think it is. Think it is. You see how incredibly more common the. Uh, <clears throat> and then our catbird, which we're fortunate to have one or two of in Hull's Gulch every year. Uh, again, way down the line, and these the other thrashers, longbill, curvebill, pandars, Mojave Desert thrashers, just tiny, tiny populations in comparison. And many of these have been sand, but you know these species that are down here are the ones that tend to be in trouble. Warblers, lots and lots and lots of warblers. It's the most common warbler. I already showed you yellow, yellow room. I hope I'm right this time. <laughs> All right, no room. Horned crown, very common way up into Alaska and shrub, four shrub communities. Uh, some up around Bogus, but they're not as common as in the wilderness. Shown here. Again, a lot of warblers with really pretty tiny, limited populations. <laughs> Most common grouse quail. I think you'd think California, but again, the boreal, think of all that tundra with all these ptarmigan up there. Really, a lot of these guys. Another eastern forest bird. I didn't even notice how many of these species. They're the top in their group are eastern forest, southern Canadian boreal forest type species, which is which is cool. It shows there's still a lot of that kind of habitat around. Peckers. It's got to be flicker or downy. Actually, I can't remember. Yay! I had my first flicker singing this week in my neighborhood and doing the yucca, yucca, yucca. Like, <laughs> stuff they do when they get together. So funny. So they're feeling it. There you go. You know what you're talking about. This is a little trickier, since owls, we don't know too much about owls, I guess. Is that a burrowing owl? Yeah. That's a burrowing owl. Long bare legs, the face. 
So that's pretty interesting. But we know that they're so adaptable, right? They're in cities and they're so, except for the nesting birds that are easy to see, they're pretty secretive. And they're probably, well, they're a lot more out there than we realize. So over two million great ones out there eating rats. Oh, never see that. Northern <laughs> saw wet. So yeah, these small forest owls, these numbers are probably fairly squishy. They're much harder to monitor. They're super secretive. They're really nocturnal most of the time. So it, it's uh, it's hard to get very good numbers on owls. Most common hummingbird? Ruby throat. Ruby throat. Eastern forest. Winds again. But close second. Rufus. Messing all up the coast, way up into Alaska. And then again, this is just tiny, tiny populations. We're going to look at this <coughs> one. Oh, and then Swainson. few more flycatchers. Lots and lots and lots of species. Another eastern forest flycatcher. You probably won't think of this one. Hmm. Another one of this group of these eastern forest boreal um, species. So alder, pretty common. And then, yay, western cubert. Hmm. So they're pretty widespread and I think that helps them, helps their numbers get up a little bit. But again, lots of flycatchers with very, very tiny Getting to the end of the groups here, I think Vireos, already showed you what number one is, Eastern Forest. Red eye. And look what a job it is to all the rest of the Vireos. Just in comparison, just not very common. But number two, um, we've got in our riparian areas and next to So this one's pretty interesting to me that one very can be so common and it's one of the top ten most common land birds in, the, in North America. Uh, and then the, but the next one in the line is just way, way, way down there, way off the charts. So it's like, what are these guys doing? It's always sort of the question, what are they doing that makes them so successful compared to other species? Okay, a few more fun facts. So if you look, go through all the families. Uh, so here's warblers, thrushes, blackbirds, vireos, flycatchers, swallows, and on and on and on. Uh, the winning family are the sparrows. Followed by warblers, thrushes, blackbirds, and vireos. Interesting. Vireos are the fifth most common group. And all the rest of these are way down here. There's not hawks and nut hatches and hummingbirds, wagtails, waxwings, swifts, tangers, cuckoos. Some of these uh, groups don't have very many species, obviously. Cuckoos, two species of cuckoo. And how many species of sparrows? 52 or something. Who is last? Who's last? Shrikes, I need a, so two species of shrikes. They eat with the northern, not very good. And there's falcons, <coughs> excipiters. I don't know, it seems like Cooper Sox are gonna bring this excipiter family up on a little bit, the way they're succeeding around our neighborhoods. So another way just to look at that, uh, look at these sort of, just fun facts, just sort of see if it makes you think anything you didn't think before. So there's more sparrows than all of these combined. <laughs> and so in my mind immediately goes, so what are sparrows doing that's so wonderful? They've diversified in species, their numbers are big. What do they do? Well, they run around on the ground and hide and eat seeds, which seems to be a really good strategy for succeeding in as an evolutionary um, strategy, if you will, and, and a food source. One of the things I uh, thought was kind of interesting to look at was to say, okay, which species, how does the counts you get on your Brady Bird survey routes compare to the actual population estimate of the species? So for example, the brown-headed cowbird is the most frequently detected species on Brady Bird survey routes in all those points in the U.S. and in southern Canada. But it's only the 25th most common species. So why do you think cowbirds are detected way more often than they should be based on how many are out there? Anyone? Anyone? Populations are very spread but not very dense. That could do it. They don't have 
don't hide. Somehow quite visible. <laughs> yeah, they don't hide. They're quite visible. On the dri driving highways and roads. They're along the roads. Those are all right on. Also, they have the male has that call note they give when they're trying to attract other males and females. It's very distinct and can be heard a long way. So they're and they're sitting on poles. They're along roads. Like I said, they're visible. They make a loud uh, call that once you get used to it, you can you, you can hear it way off. So they're just signaling and conspicuous in comparison to their numbers. Um, you can look. Well, even look at red tail. Seventh most common species detected on all these breeding bird survey routes, even though its population is way down the line. Well, it's easy, right? They're up, they're sailing around, they got a big red tail. They're not being picked up early in the morning, but in the rest of the routes, I'm running into red tails a lot of places. Anyway, you can kind of look at these other mismatches and, and uh, uh, here, here's a good one. Fourth biggest population. 19th in detections. And you may not know the Red Eyed Vireo song, but this gets to that whole idea of, of detection. It's all about detection. They have a fairly soft song. They're in the forest, and that, that song just doesn't carry very far. It's blocked by trees, and it's not very loud uh, in and of itself. So it's not detected nearly as much as you would think it would be based on how many are out there. This one just shows that these are the species that are largely integrated. So here's red winged blackbird, third most common, fourth most detected. Robin, most common bird, third most detected. Morning dove, three and eight. So some of these species are, are being detected about at the rate they should be based on how many there are. And then there's other, the, all these mismatches that I just talked about, uh, including all these guys that are either way over detected or way under detected, you would think. Uh, let's see, let's look at one more of these guys. Well, look at Blue Jay, for example. 53, 53rd most common, 18th most detected. Well, that's kind of obvious, right? You ever hear of Blue Jay? Yeah. <laughs> They're very noisy. They've got very uh, conspicuous calls, or I mean, very distinctive calls. You can hear them way off in the forest. So, you know, again, a lot of these make quite a bit of sense. And, well, look at Kestrel, for example. Yeah. That's even better. Not, you know, it's in the middle of the pack for size, but it's getting detected a lot. Well, you know what a racket they make uh, when they're calling, the you know, sitting on top of everything, they're flying around, they're chasing red tails, you know, they're, they're really conspicuous, so that's kind of fun. All right, so we already, already sort of talked about this. Um, maybe let's see if there's some more points here. So here are species in the top 20 in the population, but not in the top 20 detected. Well, let's look at dark eyed jungle, that's interesting. Second most common bird, not even in the top 20 in detectability. Remember, this is the breeding season. Where are juncos in the breeding season? They're up in the forest, and there aren't as many um, routes. A lot of times they're heavy. The forests are heavy, and you can't carry the songs as much, so they're just not detected the way you might think. Ever hear orange crown warbler? It's got a little weak two-part trill. It doesn't carry at all. Very common bird, not very much, not detected. Same for Savannah Sparrow. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one, actually. Since they, they're so loud, you'd think they'd be higher. In fact, I need to check that. I'm not sure I believe that anymore. Just a quick event, you can get all these data in the Partners in Flight Population Estimates database. And so here's the species. This was just updated a couple of years ago, and there's all kinds of other information out here you can sort. Uh, by just clicking on the column heads if you want to kind of go in there and fish around and kind of look at numbers of things. So just the last few slides here commenting on, uh, I showed you the North American Bird Conservation Initiative people. So every, just about every year, our group produces state of the birds reports. Uh, the first one was done in 2009. Then we did one, we did one in focusing on climate change, we did one focusing on public lands, one focusing on private lands. Each year is a different sort of analysis and these population estimates always play some role in how we pick what birds to focus on. Uh, like I said, it's one of the six factors where we, that we use to sort species into vulnerability classes. The last one, FYI, was done, uh, released in 2016. 
Uh, this stuff's all online if you want to peruse through there. Also in 2016, my group, Partners in Flight, subgroup of NABC, produced our updated land bird conservation plan. And again, where the population estimates play a big role in how we rank conservation priorities. Just the word that well, we don't know how about this guy yet, California Condor, but we do know that where we focus our energy on figuring out what's wrong with what's going wrong with the bird population and putting energy and science and money into reversing it, we can flip it. I mean, these guys are almost common nowadays when they were heading for extinction, both of them. Uh, I just got some more news on Kirtland's warbler. Their breeding and habitat in Wisconsin is expanding, and they're expanding in Michigan. Very focused conservation effort to get rid of brown-headed cowbirds, but mainly provide the habitat these guys like, which is sort of young, young to mid-aged jack pine. Providing more habitat and the warblers are going up. Thank you for coming. Thanks for your questions and your observations. <laughs>